Hello everyone, my name is Paul Third, and this week I have a new series that is going to be called Unpopular Audio Opinions. And this week I have decided to tackle something that is very dear to many people's hearts and is something that many people have spent a lot of money on because they're not fucking cheap <laughs> these days. However, I think it's important to give an opinion and that's all that this is, is just an opinion. It's just a, another perspective. But we're kind of going to go into the logic of using NS10s and why I personally believe that advising anybody to mix solely on NS10s or just advising a beginner to mix on NS10s. I, I think it's completely illogical. Doesn't make sense. Let's just get into it. Right, so the original NS10s were released in 1978 and they were released mainly as consumer hi-fi speakers. Not studio speakers, consumer hi-fi speakers. In regards to the sound of the original NS10, it had a frequency range of 85 hertz to 20 kilohertz, but had a roll-off beginning at around 200 hertz and a 5, that's right, you heard it, a 5 dB boost at around 2 kilohertz. Many engineers praise the NS10 for their fast transient response, however, many people found them just ridiculously bright, which is why the whole story came out about Bob Clearmount and taping like tissue paper in front of the tweeters to try and dampen uh, the high frequencies and make it less harsh. However, what they didn't know at the time, that it wasn't actually absorbing high frequencies, it was just basically reflecting back in to the tweeter, <laughs> which then caused comb filtering, which wasn't ideal in the slightest. Now there was the NS10M and the NS10N Studio, which was made um, with a horizontal orientation that was meant to be sat on top of meter bridges. And Yamaha also solved the high frequency issue by redesigning the tweeter and the crossover. Now, something that you may not know is that the NS10s were actually praised heavily for their low frequency decay time, which was extremely rapid. It was actually that fast <laughs> a decay time in the low frequencies that it was only really, really expensive uh, studio monitors that were able to do that. And why was this important? The reason why this was important is that in speakers, if your speaker has a long decay in the low frequencies, and this is very common in speakers that try to extend the low end, these time-related issues or group delay can cause a misalignment of the low end, i.e. the misbalance of kick and bass. Now, the time response was something that NS10 owners revered, mainly because it exhibited a higher than average step function, which basically meant that the transients were more perceived. Many would say that the bass was fast and it kind of came like the whole kind of statement of like NS10s were like the sound of rock and roll punch. Distortion wise, it was actually better than average for a speaker its size, but obviously you've got to think that it, <laughs> it didn't have uh, much uh, low frequency content. However, for the frequency range that it did uh, mainly produce, it was very low distortion, which at the time was actually a very, very, very good thing. Now, many engineers would say that this emphasis on the mid-range almost acted like a magnifying glass to the, essentially the most harshest kind of frequency range, like to the human ear, which would result in better translation to the monitoring systems of that time, which were essentially all kind of horrible, honky, uh, mid-rangey systems with no low end or no top end. Like, I'm waiting to be 35 this year, and even I grew up with cassettes and v VHS and shitty CD players and even really shitty MP3s. But if you think about, like, 80s and early 90s, and we think about the cassette era <laughs> and cassette players and just, like, the hi-fi systems of that time, there wasn't normally a lot of low-end unless, like, your parents had enough money to get, like, a sub or, again, just a sound system that had a decent bass that didn't overly fucking distort its own arse. And that is also why the headphones of that time all had hi-fi curves. Actually, fucking most headphones still, um, to this day, have hi-fi curves, but it is something that's becoming less and less and less. But, you know, especially in the late 80s and the 90s, you know, the headphone technology was shit, and they all had hi-fi curves because that was the sound of that. 
time. It was a massive learning process for many engineers, but what made it easier for them was the fact, and this is what I think many people forget, is that when you look at all these studios and see all these photos and you see the NS10s on the meter bridges, most studios would have mains in the walls that they could go to to check the low end and just to give themselves another reference and they'd listen really loud on the mains. So these engineers knew what good records sounded like on very, very good speakers. And without context to the high quality, you wouldn't really have the context to understand how NS10s should actually sound. Think about the low end, that there was no low end, so that you needed to have workarounds to be able to effectively judge the low end. I've heard people say that <laughs> if the low end sounds really good on an NS10, then there's way too much low end. No, I mean, it's backwards thinking. I've even read of people putting their hand on the woofer to judge the low end. Like, could you imagine having to do that in today's modern world? And that's something that you need to remind yourself, right? These speakers are not ideal. They never were ideal. They were basically kind of shoehorned to fit into, like, the audio industry. Everybody thinks that everybody used NS10s, when in actual fact they were despised by a massive, large portion of the audio industry. Like, not everybody used NS10s. And when, when I say they were despised, they were despised. And I will read you some snippets of these interviews when people talk about NS10s. Lee DiCarlo. But then you run into the trap of when you listen on a pair of NS10s. You get a lot more guitar than you thought you had, then you bring the guitar down, and when you listen to it on something else, it all goes away. Jerry Finn. NS10s are sort of a necessary evil. Most producers and bands I work with are used to them, so that's what they want to hear. And I have heard this from so many engineers that were in that period. I remember me and uh, Ed had Tim Palmer on the Working Audio Tools and we asked them about NS10s. And I remember I was thinking about, well, should, like, should I get NS10s? I see lots of people talking about them. And he was like, Paul, my advice is don't touch them with a barge pole. And honestly, it wasn't just Tim. Every engineer, I mean every engineer in my circle that I spoke to, told me not to buy NS10s. Nearly all of them don't use NS10s, or if they had used them, thought they sounded shit and didn't like them, or did use them and stopped. As we got into the noughties, you started to find that audio quality was starting to get a little bit better. The formats that we were listening to audio on, like when we think about CDs and then DVDs, Blu-ray, Streaming, devices that were outputting audio were getting better. Even you think about like Playstations and Xboxes, again, they, I remember when the Playstation came out and it had a DVD player on it, I was like, oh, oh my god, this is, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> to think back that having a DVD player on a console was like a, a massive thing, but it was <laughs> to me. However, that advancement of technology, and we think about even headphones, not how I talked about how headphones did sound pretty shit and they all kind of sounded hi-fi. 2001 was when Sennheiser first released the HD600. Now, we all know the HD600, but it came out in 2001, and that was a big release for the sound of headphones in regards to, say, like a studio environment. And it was really around kind of the noughties where neutrality became the new reference. You wanted just enough low end, but not too much. And you wanted highs, but you didn't want it to be dull. You just wanted a middle ground, which we call neutrality, which when we look at kind of speakers these days, again, we're looking for almost a flat frequency response. And in the early noughties, many people found that from KRK. Now, not the Rockets. <laughs> as soon as I said KRK, everybody blew up. The Rockets sound shit. I know, I know. I grew up with the Rockets. I know, I had Rocket 5s, Rocket 6s, Rocket 8s. Ed, his first thing were Rocket 6s. I know it's difficult to think that KRKs would be as popular as NS10s, but for a long time, those early KRKs were very renowned. And it wasn't just KRKs. Again, Dynaudio became really popular. Genelex were even more popular than they were before. I remember when I was at college, like their big speakers were the Genelex. They were like, yeah, th these are the best speakers that we can afford. And again, these speakers were made to sound good, but also made to sound neutral. And if anybody thinks I'm bullshitting about this, I will now hark back to the Mixing Engineers handbook. Here are two snippets from Two Big Engineers. Ken Han. 
We've used KRKs a lot for the last five years. That's pretty much what we've determined to be like an average stereo speaker, yet it also translates to your average TV with built-in speakers. And then, the big one, Mr. Massenberg himself. We used KRKs for the Journey record because they were rocking little monitors. Light them up and it's a completely different mix than what lights up the Tannoys and Yamahas, except whatever lights those up makes for boring mixes. I'll go to Yamahas to hear what the idiots at the record companies are listening to. Like when I said that <laughs> NS10s were despised by a lot of massive engineers. Like they were loved by a lot of massive engineers, but they were also despised by a lot of great engineers. When I say NS10 is like the epitome of Marmite in the audio industry, there's your Marmite. And with the rise of the modern engineer, you started to see less NS10 and more KRK. For example, <laughs> my lord and saviour of mixing, Mr. Spike Stent. Now, Mark was on KRKs for over... 20 years. He was on the KRK 9000s, and I remember he had the dual driver ones, I can't remember what they were called. I remember, I think he had V-series and he had smaller KRKs. And even Tura Medina, who me and Ed had on the Working Audio Tools podcast, arguably one of the biggest Latin mixers in the game today, basically based his entire career on KRKs, and then he built his own speakers. But again, he was a big, big endorsey. I think it was the V-series. KRK that he was using. And even long-term NS10 users like Dave Pensado added the KRK E-Series to his arsenal because NS10s weren't enough anymore. A lot of these engineers understood the sound and they knew that they could get good mixes out of them. However, the goalposts had shifted. Think about Tom Lordalgy, Chris Lordalgy's brother. He was on NS10s like his brother for a very, 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 very long time. And then he added the barefoot micro mains. So NS10s weren't enough anymore. They needed a neutral sounding monitor. And as the audio community has progressed, basically neutrality is everywhere. If we think about, you know, budget systems, we've got the Kali LP range, you've got PreSonus, you've got like the IKI louds, you've got neutrality at now an affordable price point. Industry-wise, I'm starting to see more Neumanns, especially barefoots. Like Ed hates the sound. <laughs> of the barefoots. But then I find it funny because when Manny Marikin talks about the barefoots, he loves them. I think it was, was it the micro mains? I can't remember what it was. I know a lot of people got into the micro mains, but I've heard a lot of shit about uh, the barefoots. But Manny, had, when he described the sound of the barefoots, he said that they weren't the prettiest sounding, but they weren't totally raw sounding either. And again, that kind of tells me that these m big mixers are looking for a system that's like an average system. They don't want all the detail in the world because they've still got to be able to hear what the average consumer is hearing, but they can't be on the shittiest system as well because that's really going to harper their average translation. And unfortunately, the NS10 does not fit that. It does not fit the mould of what's required for translation today. And even if we just think about low end, the average consumer is able to listen to so much low end now, it's crazy. Like if you think about when uh, Dre came out with the Beats, like it was so bass heavy. And even right now, we think about the Apple AirPod Pros, arguably the best selling like earbuds of like this generation. They have an adaptive EQ built into them, which from what I understand, essentially leans in to the Fletcher Munson curve. So the louder you listen, you get less bass and less highs. And the quieter you listen, you get more bass and more highs. Which means that regardless of the level of the consumer, they are getting the same sound. Which is very important to understand when you know that the AirPod Max, so the Apple headphones, their frequency response is a basically spot on to the Harman curve all the way up to like 1K. Now for anybody that's unsure about Harman, I'll leave a link to a video here and I'll kind of go through what Harman is. Essentially, long story short, uh, the Harman curve is a kind of frequency response related to speakers in a treated room. And to many people that's not used to listening to headphones that are EQ'd to Harman, they'll find Harman is v like the bass is too much, it's way too much. It took me like a week to get used to it. And now obviously my ears are tuned that way. But it's very important to understand Harman now because in regards to the average consumer, i.e. the Apple iPod Pros, 
they are getting low end that is similar to that of low end of neutral speakers in a treated room. Even budget in-ears are being fully tuned to the in-ear Harman curve. You've got an over-ear and an in-ear. Honestly, you could get full frequency range and big bass out of like 40, 50 pound in-ears. However, don't get me wrong, obviously we still have smartphones that are all fucking mid-range and most laptop speakers sound absolutely terrible. But even if we consider the uh, the Apple MacBook Pro, like that could easily do like 90 hertz comfortably. Like I couldn't believe the quality of the Apple MacBook Pro speakers. I was like, fucking hell, I'm just used to like no bass and like <laughs> all mid-range. But they are very, very good. Like I did like a, a pre-mix with them and it actually translated quite decent when I brought it into my own mix session. So technology is always advancing and the main aim is to be as neutral as possible. Fuck, even if we think of like TV soundbars, like you can get TV soundbar setups that go down to like 25, 30 hertz. Like even my parents, like they don't have a Scooby <laughs> about audio and even they have a soundbar with a sub in their room and it's full frequency range when they're watching movies. And when you understand the importance of low end, when you understand how important nailing low end is for modern genres, again we think of 808s and we just think of like essentially genres that like dictate like really big but tight bottom end like there's been mixers that have essentially created entire careers on nailing low end because nowadays if your low end isn't right and it's super boomy you stick it on a car stereo it's going to sound fucking horrible it's going to drown out I mean I've even <laughs> had some sh like shitty mixes that haven't really managed their low end right and it's rattling the fuck it's rattling the car speakers. And that's why guys like Jason Joshua started to kind of climb up that ladder because he understood how to manage low end, how to get low end to be tight but big and also to work with the limiters as well. Because again, as the loudness wars came in and all the limiting came in, everything changed. Like it was a different world, like 80s and NS10s <laughs> is a completely different world to the world we live in today with like minus five, minus six LUFS masters. And even if we think about the Amazon Echoes with the Alexas, basically after version 3, I mean, if you listen to an Amazon Echo, they sound very, very, very neutral. Actually, I'd say a little bit too neutral. It, they've got just enough low end just to catch the kick. Not a lot of top end, but the mid-range is very, very neutral. And what me tell you why that is? is because it cannot be fatiguing. These days, products have got to justify their price. And the more that a product is used, the more it justifies its price. So when you think about something as common and as popular as an Amazon Echo, it cannot be fatiguing. It cannot be like the NS10s and fatiguing and harsh in the mid-range. Essentially, the longer that people listen to Amazon Echoes, the less likely that they are to buy a Bluetooth speaker, the more likely they are to stay subscribed to Amazon Music. Again, in a world of subscriptions, it's all about keeping the user on that platform. And as mixing engineers or, again, songwriters or musicians that want to mix their own music, you've got to adapt to the consumer of today, which essentially, on the most part, are listening to systems that sound very neutral. And that is why a speaker like NS10 is completely redundant for the modern consumer. I mean, even Bob Clearmountain, the man that popularised the NS10, even he doesn't use NS10s anymore for mixing. If you go on his website for the studio, he's got an equipment list, and he's telling you that it's on standby now. It's in a fucking cupboard <laughs> somewhere gathering dust because he replaced the NS10 with the Yamaha MSP7, which is essentially a very neutral sounding speaker. It doesn't suffer from the bass loss of the NS10 and it doesn't have that 5 dB boost at 2 kHz. And when you put it into that context that even the man that made the NS10 popular, that everybody when they talk about NS10s normally talk about Bob Clearmountain, <laughs> when you put it into the context even he's not using them, surely that's telling you something. Now many of you will be asking, Paul, well what do you advise that I buy then? What do you advise that I look for in a studio monitor. Very simple, neutrality. Just try and find a neutral monitoring setup. If you are mixing on headphones, EQ them to Harman because what is Harman trying to emulate? 
the sound of speakers in a treated room. If you're looking to buy speakers, aim for as flat a frequency response as possible, which is most fucking speakers that come out. Again, you look at the Adams, Callies, Presonus, fucking name them. They're all aiming to be as flat as possible. However, I will say that just because it can measure flat on a frequency graph doesn't mean that they all sound the same. All monitors have their own sound and the more that you go up that chain price-wise, you'll find that you do get a better quality of sound. And again, it's all about, again, you know, cabinet resonance. And again, watch the present day production, guys, man. Like they've done a lot. I mean, I remember they filled... Did they fill the calleys with concrete? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, ah, this has actually solved some of the resonance issues. However, saying that, <laughs> I still think Cali LPs are way better for somebody starting out than trying to fucking st start mixing on NS10s. Instead of trying to force a mix to sound great <laughs> on like a black box that isn't really meant f for today, try and invest in as many different monitoring options as possible. Many people have this thing where they're fixed on one speaker. I'm going to tell you something right now. There is no such thing as a perfect speaker. It does not exist. There is no such thing as a perfect headphone. That's why I mix on like three different pair of headphones. My HE1000 SEs from Hyphaman, for like two grand. I mix on them like 80% of the time because they have the sim stage in the best resolution that I've ever heard. However, you either get sim stage or you either get like punch and transients. Like, it's a compromise. You normally don't get the two. That's why Warren Hewitt has his Genelex and he has his Reds. When I was in Warren's old studio in LA, I was listening, like, doing EBs back and forth, and the Genelex reminded me of the HE1000 SEs, and the Reds reminded me of the Ananda Nanos. You know what I mean? He had two different sims. There weren't just two speakers that sounded the same. That's pointless. He had two speakers which gave him a different character, a different sound, helping him with translation. That's why I've also got the All OS 5X and I use that with decent eek real phones because it's got all the emulations. So I'll sit and listen to a pair of NS10s. I'll sit and listen to a pair of uh, mono cubes, which are like autotones. I've even got monitors behind me. I've got the Kali INUNF. I've got my Atmos room. I've got the PreSonus Eris Studio 8s coming. Like, and I'm even thinking about getting Apple AirPod Pros <laughs> just so I can kind of hear what everybody's listening to. And you may hear the old saying of You just need to learn your monitoring. If you learn your monitoring, you'll be able to mix anything. When the reality is, you can't mix what you can't hear. <laughs> if you're on NS10s, you're not going to hear the low end. So you're going to have to invest in a sub, which many people did and they said they got better results. But as I said about the difference between Warren speakers and my headphones, there's different details. I mean, you might get a great punch from say the NS10s, but you e easily could lack the fucking sound stage. You know what I mean? And these are all things that are important to understand to build up an average. There are obviously mixers that can make NS10s work. And if you learn the sound of NS10s, you may be able to make it work. But what I'm going to tell you is that it's going to be a fucking bollock for you. And if you're a beginner, it's going to completely confuse you. And you're going to wonder why the mixes aren't translating. Why? Because you don't have the audio journey. You don't have the context to what a mix should sound like on a high quality system. You don't know what some stage should sound like. You don't know what good low end should sound like. You don't know what good transient response sounds like. You don't know what tight, fast, low end <laughs> should sound like. Again, you can't mix what you can't hear. NS10s could be a great secondary reference if you understand the sound. Again, because they're so harsh, you might be able to understand that there's a certain level of harshness to an NS10 and you can have a certain purpose in mind. And that's where I think that an NS10 would be good for somebody if you have a set purpose with it. But you don't need to buy an NS10 because if you want the whole kind of NS10 thing, I know you won't get like the, the fucking the, the fast kind of low frequency decay time, but if you want just the mid range, just get a high pass filter and a low pass filter, add, for, add a 5 dB boost at 2K, and it'll kind of give you a, a rough idea of that kind of harsh mid range kind of push sound. And there you have it. There is my unpopular opinion regarding the logic behind buying NS10s in 2024.